Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel. I'm Rob and I hope you are having a wonderful day today. Today, I have three stories for you from the Malicious Compliance subreddit. Let's jump right in. This story comes to us from ZMDYX. Karen demands to go through bear territory, almost gets mauled by a grizzly. So for a little context, this story is not mine. This happened to my father in the 80s and the 90s, but I will write in the first person because English is hard. In the 80s, I lost everything I could. I dropped out of college, my father died of a heart attack, and my mother was somewhere in the wind. I wasn't worth the air I was breathing. As a last effort, I saved up some money to move to a different state so that I could start fresh. I chose Montana to be my new home. Because I didn't have a college degree, I knew I could only make a living with my hands and not my head. After a bit of looking around, I found work on a ranch. The owner of the ranch, let's call him Jack, took me under his wing. He taught me how to ride a horse, how to herd, how to do cutting, roping, and many other useful skills on a ranch. My goal was to have enough money for a deposit so I could buy a house or at least some land. After about three years, I had the money, but I loved the ranch and the folks so much that I chose to stay longer. In the spring of 88, I finally made the decision to quit. I was fully honest with Jack about what my intentions were. I told him that I wanted to buy some land to have a ranch of my own and potentially get married and start a family. Being the absolute champ, Jack offered me some contacts of people who were selling land. After some time, I chose a piece of land near Jack's ranch. I got a loan, bought the land, and in the summer, I started building my house. By winter, the house was done, and it was planned that in the spring, I'll build a barn and some fences, corrals, among others. In the spring, it was back to work, and before summer started, I had nothing to do. I had a lot of time on my hands while I was waiting for all the paperwork to be done. And I wasn't going to spend two weeks sitting on my porch doing nothing when Jack promised me that if I would ever need it, he would give me a job. Now, I didn't need a job because of money, but I just didn't have anything to do. So I went to my good old friend Jack if he needed some help. He said that he could use me to guide people on the tours he was offering. His ranch is not only in the cattle business, he also offers tours of the pristine nature on his property. I happily accepted the job, despite me not liking people. But still, it was better than just sitting on my front porch and doing nothing. The first few days went without a problem, but then a wild Karen appeared to brighten up the day. I was just returning from a tour when I saw this Karen in the middle of the field yelling at this girl, who was also a guide. I didn't know the girl, but in my books, whoever makes a girl cry is a butthole. I came over to them and in the most passive-aggressive voice I can, I say, good day, what seems to be the problem? And the Karen's wrath was now aimed at me, and she yelled back, this bee has no respect for the desires of the customer. Give me a manager now. Now, I didn't expect such strong wording, but I kept my cool despite my hot-headedness, and I came up to the girl, who's now sobbing because this Karen was mouthing off to her pretty good. And I say to her, leave her to me, I'll take care of her. You go take a break and tell Jack that I'll be with this piece of work. She gives me a grateful smile and a nod and rides away. I go to the Karen and say to her, ma'am, I can't get you the manager as he's busy right now, but if you want, I can be your guide in her stead for the remainder of the tour. She replies very politely by saying, sure, I think even the trees will be better than that bee. Every part of my hot-headed self wants me to pretty much bury this woman right then and there, but I keep my cool and we head off on the tour. And within the first minute, what a piece of work she truly is. She behaves like she knows best and everyone is lesser than her and everything should be given to her. When we are about to turn around and go back, I give her a choice. We could either go the official route or we could return by the unofficial route which is shorter, but there were bear sightings reported in the past few days. I tell her that the unofficial route is quite dangerous, but just as I wanted her to do so, she vehemently objects because she is the wisest person alive and knows the best. Great, my trap had worked. After about five miles on this unofficial route, she starts screaming and turns so pale that she is even more white than paper. 
in the distance, there is a grizzly. I knew about the danger I dragged both of us into, but in the end, it was technically her choice to go that route. I tell her to make herself as big and loud as she can. I follow suit, but the bear keeps getting closer. It keeps growling at us. With every growl, Karen was getting even more pale. After it gets way too dangerous, I shoot a round out of my rifle, and the bear gets scared and runs away into the woods. The entire ride back, she keeps yelling at me that I put her intentionally in so much danger. And yes, I'll admit, it was quite reckless taking a visitor into a part of the woods where there were bear sightings reported, but technically she made the decision to go that route. I stay silent the entire ride because I can't keep a straight face. I was laughing maniacally in my head, and I knew that if I looked at her, I would start laughing out loud. When we returned, she was shaking violently and was pale as ever. After I tied up her horse, she demanded that I get her the manager, and I gladly pointed her to the little building in the distance, and she storms off. She starts yelling at Jack, and I can see that Jack is trying his hardest not to break out laughing. I could hear that she was demanding that I be fired, but the neat part was, I wasn't an employee of Jack's. I was doing it as a favor for a friend, and thus, I couldn't be fired. After Karen's tirade ends, Jack comes to me laughing like a kid, and he asks me, how did you even come up with that, OP? I start giggling as well and answer, well, she made the girl cry, so I wanted to give her special treatment. I heard of the bear sightings, and it worked out well in my favor. He then asks me not to do that again as it was reckless, and I agree and tell Jack, I don't plan on doing it again, but I had a plan if the bear mauled the damn wretch. My defense would be that I gave her the choice to go on a safer path, but because she was apparently of higher intellect than me, I simply agreed. Jack gave me a smile and heads off. Years later, my father would end up meeting that girl guide again. Her name was Abby, but nowadays, I simply call her mom. Jumping down to the comment section, there's one from a user called Anarchy. It says, I truly don't understand why anyone would still humor this woman after she swore at an employee and abused her. Whatever happened to, I'm sorry ma'am, your money is no longer good here. I just don't get it. OP replied to this one and said, man, of course this is the most sensible option, but that's just who my father is. That's simply the way things were here in the West. See, the major problem here is that when we let Karens be a Karen, it just enforces that they can get away with that behavior. We need to put our foot down. We need to say that's not acceptable. You can't treat people like that, and you're not going to get what you want. In fact, Karen, I think you should get the F off of the property. But I guess that's not how it works in some places, and that really sucks. <laughs> This story comes to us from Smooth Area 1206 Schooled in Compliance. It's the late 80s, early 90s in the UK, but the compliance runs over about five years. Puberty hit me hard and early just as I started high school, 11 years old. If that wasn't enough to deal with, it also saw between the acne, eczema, and psoriasis, my skin becoming a huge red and blotchy mess of blisters sciatic plaques, and acne breakouts, to the point just laying down left little spots of blood on shirts, t-shirts, and bedsheets. Over the summer between my first and second year, it got considerably worse. None of the medicated creams were helping, and the only time I got any sort of relief was when I was given steroids and antibiotics for the frequent chest infections I got. But that wasn't a long-term solution. The second year of high school gave us a whole new bunch of school rules to abide by. This is where the compliance begins. By the end of the first week of the year, I'd already had complaints about my appearance. My form tutor, Mrs. G, an amazing woman, understood the issues I was having, not just with the skin, but my home life too. My folks had split, dad was a drunk, and that's a whole other story for another Reddit. So our income wasn't great. Mom worked two jobs, and her mental health wasn't the best either, dealing with the messy divorce, etc. But apparently the little bloodstains on my shirt were against the new business-like dress code, meant to prepare us for our work lives after school. So letters went home, and I got a detention, since they were in the no exceptions period. 
Mom was annoyed, so we instigated an undershirt rule and short sleeve shirts to leave the worst areas open, and we got our GP to issue a medical note regarding my skin. After all, I was there almost every week, it seems. This wasn't enough, and the more unforgiving teachers really kicked up about my arms being shown and using the words appalling and detrimental to the learning environment, despite my classmates knowing about the issues and not being overly bothered. So I was told off again, and this time sent up to the head of year tutor for a formal meeting. Now, Mr. E was a rather amiable older guy who taught languages, and he had a well-known catchphrase in the school. I like it, I do it myself, just not in school. Which was used liberally when it came to catching kids with shirts untucked, smoking, or making out under the staircases. He was apologetic, knowing it was a medical issue, and requested the GP to do something, repeating the line detrimental to the learning environment, and that being in the business of learning, I had to conform. I was given 14 days for my skin to improve, or I would be placed in more detentions as per policy. Two weeks go by, and my skin from stress was breaking out everywhere, so I end up in detention each night for a week, missing the school bus, which really pissed my mom off and her boss, given she had to come and collect me since it would have taken over an hour for me to walk home. Each time Mr. E or another year tutor was there, complaining about the state of my skin and asking why I wasn't taken to a doctor, each time my mom showing the appointment slips and notes from the GP. Finally, it seemed like my arms were settling just as my face erupted with acne and shaving my face was a mess. This pissed off the school even more. So my mom suggested that one of the teachers like Mr. E attend the doctor's appointment with me and to tell the doctor what they thought. They discussed this and eventually it was decided that the teacher to come along was Mr. E himself. Mr. E complained at the order that came from the headmaster, a grizzled old teacher who had a dirty unkempt beard and eyebrows like rutting caterpillars and he passed on his complaints to me and my mother. I did my best to ignore his eyes that seemed to be drilling into me angrily as my mom went in to speak to my doctor first for her appointment. She explained what was happening as I was called in next. Mr. E stormed into the room ahead of me immediately trying to lay down school rules. I remember phrases like, this is school policy, and our job to prepare them for working life, and... I don't care about side effects of medication, it needs to be done now. The doctor looked down over his glasses and just asked, You are? Smiling at my mom. To which Mr. E did an impression like a goldfish. He asked to see my back and arms, so I took off my shirt. For the first time, Mr. E saw the full extent of the issue and just went white. The doc said to anyone who was listening, Stress and puberty don't help conditions like this and they will, given time, normally settle down. He asked if I'd been using the cream. I nodded as he picked at one problematic area, removing one of the plaques, saying he sent this to the lab as it looked a little unusual. Mr. E remained quiet as he examined me further, looking at how easy my skin bled in certain areas. The doc said I could get dressed again. You're a teacher, he said, looking at Mr. E. I'm a school governor for X school, our immediate rival and I'm also on the local education authority board. Mr. E's color still hadn't returned, but he nodded. The doc then went to his computer and typed out another letter, this time effectively adding that I can be excused from the usual rules as a new medical policy was being written by the LEA that all schools must follow. He then told Mr. E he could leave. He sat and chatted to both me and my mom for a while, and basically said to continue what I was doing and it will clear up. He said the letters will be at the desk along with another prescription for us both. Mom gave Mr. E the letter and just said, I hope that puts an end to this nonsense. Mom didn't bother dropping Mr. E back at the school. The next day, Mr. E ignored me, and to be honest, most of the teachers were either their usual grouchy self or sickly sweet, with Mrs. G being her usual happy self asking about the appointment as if she knew what had gone down in the staff meeting. End of term was upon us, so for a whole fortnight, I didn't bother shaving and let my face just rest. So the return to school, I shaved and cleaned up the best I could. And Mr. E was immediately on my case, be it my work in his French and Spanish class or just in general. 
I'd go home and tell mom all about it and she would take notes. Now into year 9 or third year of high school, 14 years old, it's 1991. Skin was healing in parts but my face looked like a volcano and I'd grown out a neat little mustache which my mom helped me neatly trim and we had managed to sort out the really dry lips so I could eat and drink without them splitting, which had put me off food. Now the new medical exemption had come into effect, forcing the school to change their rules. As I got off the bus, I could see the teachers immediately go into meltdown over the facial hair, and they weren't happy. I got to lunchtime before I was dragged by my collar into the year tutor's office and had three of them and a deputy head lay into me about it. They demanded I remove it, handing me a single cheap razor that looked as if it had been used. I refused to shave, citing my medical note and that I wouldn't use anyone else's razor purely for my own safety given the existing issues. So I was sent home. It seems my mom had been called, so she had called the doctor about it given his role in the LEA. I arrived at school the next day, my mustache still in place, and was called into the headmaster office, only to introduce to the chair of the LEA and my doctor, with the head looking a little browbeaten. Apparently, the chair had already been shown photos of my back and arms by my doctor, and could see what's happening with my face and the neat mustache. He asked me a few questions and smiled, saying this wasn't my fault, etc and that a new rule, especially for my school, was being put into place, and it would be checked frequently, and I or any student could ask for a surprise check to be made by LEA staff. The new rule was, if students were meant to live by the strict dress and appearance code, then so were the teachers, and only those with medical exemptions like mine were allowed, but it had to be neat and tidy. I was there to see an announcement being made over the rarely used school tannoy system, it was reconfirmed in the school assemblies over the following week. Letters went home to parents and it seemed there was a sigh of relief among them, as it seems I wasn't the only one getting grief from the rules that had been in place. The teachers had two weeks to adjust. The whole LEA was there to check the teachers and a number had public meltdowns in regards to their appearance, including the deputy head Mrs. B, who normally wore layers of makeup and blue eyeshadow, who swore up and down she was exempt because she was deputy head. Stories spread around the school like wildfire. Even Mr. R, the headmaster, lost his beard. Yes, I got more grief about it, but Mrs. G kept them away from my grades. The mustache stayed until the end of my time in high school. Funnily enough, over that summer, my skin seemed to clear up almost instantaneously. So, by my first day of college to do my A-levels, my face was clear, and I could shave off the mustache. My brother attended the school the September after I left. The teachers didn't give him a hard time for fear of what he would do, but the firm rule stayed in place about teachers' appearance until the school merged with the rival back in 2013. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called This Will Soon End Badly. <laughs> It says, my blood is boiling over the fact that so many adults were happy to put you through that, as if you were bleeding from everywhere for fun or something. Your mom is a rock star and your doctor is a badass. I hope you're thriving nowadays. OP responded to this and said, I dropped facial hair for a while, but now use it to cover up a few scars, so rock a beard and a mustache. It sounds to me like these teachers just needed something to argue about, like they didn't like OP for some reason. What kind of person puts you in detention for something you have absolutely no control over, like a skin disorder? That makes absolutely no sense. Even a little bit of common sense, and they would have realized that OP couldn't do anything about this. Somebody in OP situation should just be getting sympathy from the school and accommodations to help. This whole story is absolute bullcrap. This story comes to us from Simon Pig. You want this app fully released at February 1st? No problem. Years ago, I was a low-level IT manager at a major media company. My team was understaffed. We had too many projects to care for and no IT tester to test our apps. So me, the programmers, and the product owner, a business side non-technical member, needed to test our apps ourselves. The IT director, my boss, never helped with this issue because of budget reasons. 
it was common knowledge that the company has major money problems for years. It sucked, but we managed to properly care for our apps. Our primary project was redesigning our sport news app that produced the biggest revenue with mobile ads. The app was 8 plus years old at this point and it worked like a really old car, so obviously we were creating it from scratch. It was a slow process because at the same time we needed to update and fix many other apps. We were basically a skeleton crew. The problem started when the product owner left and was replaced by someone that I can only describe as cartoonishly not fit for the job. It was a person that did not care for the product, users, or other people. The only important thing for her was to make her boss, a business director, happy. An ideal yes man. She also was lazy and had no true experience or knowledge about creating mobile apps. She never really did anything important that the former product owner did. What she was doing was organizing meetings, going to meetings, drinking coffee, and just slacking off on the web. It was not a big deal for me because I did my job well and everything was going forward as planned. And she behaved okay-ish. Important part is that she did not test the app, and she really didn't know or wanted to know the app. I have never seen her using any of our apps now that I think about it. One day, she informed us that there is some internal deadline for finishing our app, and it is February 1st, almost a full year later. This is just some budgeting date that for any sane company is not that important for in-house projects. We informed her that with all our responsibilities and lack of programmers, the chances of finishing every planned function are near zero. But we could release a basic version of the app without this and that function for a really small portion of the users, like 1%. Later, we could update the app with missing stuff and then progressively go to 100%. She was happy with the solution and the whole team was informed about our plan. So we proceeded as before, creating the new app and caring for the other apps at the same time, and informed about our new app progress every week. Fast forward to November, and I have a short vacation period. When I return, I learn that the new PO is furious with our progress, even though everything is going according to plan. During my absence, she informed our bosses that we are in crisis mode because the app will not be ready for February 1st, and we, and mainly me, are to blame. Turns out, her boss wanted the whole app to be ready and not some basic version of it. She never really informed him of our agreed plan, or he changed his mind, or whatever. So, she tells everyone that the plan was always to fully release the whole app. And now, we are the liars. No one took our side, and at this point, I was already looking for a new job, because F that crap. We needed to cut many functions after all, because it was just impossible at this point to finish them. Here's the malicious compliance. I stayed at the company until the deadline, and the last thing I did was releasing the new app to every single user. One of the most important parts of the app were the mobile ads that created the revenue. The app itself was free. I created the ads just as I was told to, and tested them myself. The PO did not test the app. So, nobody noticed that the new app had way less ads that were showing way less frequent. But what the app had is more bugs, of course, because we couldn't properly test everything with that amount of work in that short time with no tester. Month after release, the ad revenue plummeted and the users were not happy with the app so many of them moved to other news apps. I was happily working somewhere else at this time, and I heard that it was total chaos with this new app. Because of the revenue issue, the PO and her boss even considered bringing the old app back, which is hilarious, because that crap barely worked. Last time I checked, even the most die-hard programmer that worked there for more than a decade, which is a miracle in IT, said F it and left sometime later. Years later, and she still works there, the current team is still understaffed and overworked, the apps are buggy and poorly managed. Meanwhile, I have the best job of my life, and for many years, everyone is extra happy with my management. OP added a couple of edits down below. The first one says, In my country, working in IT is a general term. It can be sysadmin, it can be software dev, it can be even scrum master. I was both software dev and a manager. 
Also, I'm not a native English speaker, so sorry for any mistakes. Two, yes, I effed up royally by not getting exact scope of our plan in writing. Of course, I know that now. I was stupid back then, and I did not expect to be effed like that by someone from my own team. We had UX sheets, etc., but it was for the whole app. There was no indication what will be in the finished product. This was in-house project, not some software house job. 3. To everyone implying that I made this up, why would I? This is not some crazy, I was super smart and my revenge was awesome story. I'm the stupid effing idiot in this rather boring story. If I would be making this up, there would be at least three explosions, guys. 4. Yes, right now, I have the best job ever. And by that, I mean the salary is great, the project is fun, and I work with awesome people. I'm not saying I'm some president of human-cat relations, because that would really be the best job ever. Also, I was not fired. I bailed as soon as I found a better job. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, there's one from a user called Wooden11. It says, always get it in writing, especially when you think everything is all good. If the project manager is so inept they can't even make meeting minutes a sprint report, then do it yourself and send a brief follow-up email just to document and validate what I have for the meeting agreements and action items. Yeah, we hear this in a lot of stories. You really do need to cover your butt when it comes to any kind of work. Whether it's going bad, whether it's going good, start now. Document everything. Collect the paperwork. Collect the emails. Have that in your back pocket. Because when things go to crap, you just might need that information to come out on top. OP, I'm glad you're in a job you're enjoying now because it really sounds like that last one was absolute BS. Check out all three OPs linked in the description down below. I thank you for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow. If that wasn't enough to deal with, it also saw between the Acme... <laughs>